This video introduces two important concepts that will be at the core of your study of constitutional law, powers and limits. The video also introduces this diagram that's used throughout the casebook as a way of illustrating the relationship between powers and limits. Now in ordinary conversation, someone might ask, can the government do that? It's a perfectly sensible bottom line question. For constitutional lawyers, however, the bottom line can only be understood by working through two different conversations, one involving sources of power and another involving limits on how the powers can be used. Let's start by imagining that various parts of a constitution create lists of things that the government may do and may not do. Powers are the list of things that the government is allowed to do. And limits are the list of things that the government is not allowed to do. Why do we need two different lists? It's because sometimes the powers and the limits are focused on different concepts, so they fit together differently. Here's a simple example drawn from the United States Constitution. Now, the U.S. Constitution identifies a number of things that the national government can do. And two important items on this list include regulating commerce among the states and making laws for the District of Columbia, the place where the national government has its capital. So why put these particular powers in the Constitution? And why give the national government the ability to exercise those powers? Well, for the commerce power, one goal of the Constitution was to create a national economy with some uniform economic rules. Instead of hoping that all of the states would agree to those rules independently, the responsibility is given to a central government. As for the District of Columbia, once again, the idea is to have national lawmaking happen in a context that's not dominated by any particular states. So it happens in a non-state zone. Now, what I've just talked through is the kind of conversation that lawyers and judges might have regarding powers. If Congress passed a law requiring all adults to wear polka dotted shirts on Wednesdays, we could see that that wouldn't really be authorized by either of the powers that we're talking about. So what about this law? Bibles may not be sold across state lines or within the District of Columbia. Now this is a troubling law, but it's not because Congress lacks the power to enact it. Sales of goods across state lines, that's a type of commerce, and Bibles are a type of goods. It's also a regulation of what is allowed to happen within the District of Columbia. In this particular case, the reasons why this law is troubling are not found in the powers conversation. Instead, they come up during the limits conversation. Here we see that the government may not abridge freedom of speech or the press, and it may not prohibit free exercise of religion. Now, in this limits conversation, we're looking at different language from different places in the Constitution. And we'd be talking about different constitutional goals that reflect different parts of the nation's history and values than the goals that we discuss when talking about powers. This chart shows the interaction of the powers conversation and the limits conversation. It's fairly intuitive, but you can see that an action by the government is constitutional only if the government is relying on an available source of power and it's not using that power in a way that violates some applicable limit. Sometimes one or the other constitutional conversation will clearly be the more relevant one. In our Bible example, the First Amendment limits were obviously more important. But it's also quite common for both kinds of conversations to occur in a single case. It's also common that the results flowing from these constitutional conversations are debatable. And that's because the exact boundaries of the powers and the limits aren't expressed unambiguously. The Constitution unavoidably uses general language, and we have to decide how to apply it in particular circumstances. So if we want to visualize all of this in a single diagram, we would need a picture that includes both conversations, shows the relationship between them, and shows that the boundaries of the powers and the limits are constantly being adjusted on a case-by-case -case basis. An image that helps accomplish all this is the famous optical illusion that's called the Rubin vase. 
If you focus on the dark shape in the middle, it looks like a vase that could hold flowers. But if you focus on the white areas on either side of that shape, it looks like two faces in conversation with each other. In fact, your mind may flip back and forth so that when you concentrate on the faces, the vase seems to almost disappear and vice versa. So on this diagram, sources of power for a government are represented by the vase and limits on that power are represented by the faces. And a star represents a governmental action that we're trying to decide whether it's constitutional. So if there's a source of power to enact a law, and that law would not violate any applicable limit, then the law is constitutional, and we can position it inside the vase. So an example could be a law making it illegal to sell heroin across state lines, or in the District of Columbia. Meanwhile, a law that bans sales of Bibles across state lines, or in the District of Columbia, violates the First Amendment. So that star falls into the limit zone and is not constitutional. Finally, a law requiring everyone to wear polka dotted shirts on Wednesdays doesn't fall within the powers, so it's also outside the vase. So these examples are pretty simple, but some examples will be much harder to situate. These are debatable laws, and we can portray them as living along the edge of the vase and the edge of the faces. So if we decide that the law either is or is not constitutional, our understanding of where the edges are can change. So this is shown by the vase and the faces changing size in comparison to each other, growing or shrinking. As an illustration of how this diagram operates, let's imagine a problem under a hypothetical constitution. The constitution of this hypothetical government includes an enumerated power to regulate harmful property. This constitution also protects the rights of people to enjoy the companionship of safe pets. So now, let's imagine the legislature enacts a law that forbids pit bulls. The constitutionality of this statute hinges on a powers conversation and a limits conversation. The power conversation asks what the government is authorized to do. We would be thinking about meanings of words like property. Is a pit bull a type of property? And we would think about harmful. What are the harms that this constitution is really concerned about? We might also ask, what does it mean to regulate something? Is banning something the same as regulating it? The result of this powers conversation will tell us something about the extent of the power to regulate harmful property. So if this is the first case that applies this power to animals, we might think of the power getting bigger than we used to think it was. The limits conversation hinges on different constitutional language altogether. Here, we're defining completely different terms, things like companionship and safe and pets. And we're thinking not about what power would be good for the government to have, but what rights it would be good for people to have. The outcome of this conversation can be envisioned as the face getting larger. Now, of course, when the face gets larger, the vase gets smaller. So if there's a source of power, it still can't be used in a way that violates this particular limit, which in this example we might have decided is a little bigger than we thought before. All of this combines to give us an overall diagram that has three parts. First, for a government action to be constitutional, there needs to be a source of power that authorizes that kind of action, and that's represented by the vase. The source of power must not be used in ways that violate either of two types of limits. One set of limits are known as structural limits. These are things like separation of powers, or federalism, or supremacy. Another set of limits are known as individual rights.